Good morning and welcome to today's session. Thank you so much for joining us today and we are pretty excited to have you here. My name is Lovejoy Ocher, a manager with the tax and legal department here at Deloitte and I will be your moderator for today. As we may be aware, the Ghana Revenue Authority has started the phased implementation of an electronic VAT invoicing system. And on the webinar today, we seek to discuss what the EVAT is about and how its implementation would change VAT compliance. We plan to spend two hours for the session. Before we, we get started, let's take note of a few housekeeping rules. First, we would like to mention that this webinar is being recorded for future use. Currently, all participants have been muted. However, if you have questions during the Q&A session, you can raise your hands and you will be unmuted to speak. You can as well drop all your comments and questions in the Q&A chat box on your screen. A survey link will be put in the chat box for you to provide us with your feedback get into the end of the session. To have a more interactive discussion, we have created pools within the program to take your feedback on the topic. We'll have our first poll now to get familiar with the process. On your screen now, you can not see a pop-up. Read the question and provide us with your feedback. No answer is wrong, so feel free to express yourself. Thank you, I see a lot of responses coming. Thank you so much. Let's take a moment to introduce our panelists and our guest speaker for the day. Our first speaker or panelist today is in the person of Gideon Ayiobu, who is a partner with the tax and regulatory team here in Deloitte, Ghana. Gideon has a certain accounting experience of over 16 years with big four accounting firms here, working with clients across all business spectrums by providing tax advice services. Over the years, he has had a stint in the United Kingdom and has led several tax engagements for privately held businesses and large. Publicly held corporations in Ghana, Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Gambia. The next panelist is in the person of Edward Akins. He is a senior manager with the consulting technology services here in the Lord Khan. Edward has extensive experience within the tech communications, technology and fintech space across the UK, Middle East and Africa, and has managed roles in applications management, technology product development and business development. Before joining Deloitte, Edward worked with Vodafone Group UK, Vodafone Ghana, Huawei West Africa, and other banking and technology institutions. We'll move on to the next panelist. Our next speaker for today is in the person of George Alcuma. He is the lead partner for tax and regulatory team here in Lloyd, Ghana. And George has over 20 years experience with seven clients by providing them with the entire spectrum of tax services. George's professional career started with the Ghana Revenue Authority, where he worked for over eight years and rose to the level of Principal Inspector of Taxes. He has proudly worked with two of the big four firms in Ghana and has a great worth of industry experience having worked with Newmont Mining as a senior manager in charge of tax services. He has grown the performance of the Deloitte Ghana tax function over 400% over the past years. To our guest speaker for the day.
he is in the person of Philip Appa. And he is the assistant commissioner. He's assistant commissioner of VAT administration with the Ghana Revenue Authority, GRE. Philip is an assistant commissioner with the GRE and he's in charge of the VAT administration. He brings into his role 18 years of experience in public practice, banking, taxation, and commerce. He's a Deloitte alumni from the Bermuda office and worked with the firm for six years. He then moved to Butterfield Trust Bank as head of Wealth and Trust Management Division. He's also a former Citibank Canada employee where he held a position within the hedge fund space. Until recently, he was a CFO and a board member of a US big private equity firm with significant global presence in charge of a diversified portfolio. Thank you so much to our speakers for lending us their time this morning. I would at this moment hand over to Gideon. Gideon, if you can hear me, please proceed. Okay, thank you very much, Lovejoy. And uh, thank you for your welcoming words. And I'm looking forward to see more results of the polls, uh, which will be shared with everyone at the end of this uh, session. And before I go ahead, I would like to give an opportunity to uh, Africa tax, tax technology uh, leader in the person of Tumi Magas to share a few words or comments uh, before I proceed. So Tumi, uh, if, if you can take away from here. Hello, to me, maybe if you are you're on uh, mute. I, I think I'm on now. Okay. Hello, Gideon. Hi. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much, Gideon, for um, uh, having me on for a little bit. Uh, I just have to say, you know, with e-invoicing, I'm really excited to see how tax authorities um, across Africa are, are, are really looking at how do they digitally transform? How do they close the revenue gap um, using enabling technology? And, um, you know, e-invoicing is the most exciting because um, it talks to a lot of data. And um, it's a, if done right, I believe it can help um, Africa leapfrog, you know, into digital transformation. And because we are only thinking about how do we do it now and only implementing it uh, now, it, um, we've got the, the opportunity to get it right. Uh, because we've seen so many um, revenue authorities uh, globally, how they've implemented um, this type of um, real-time data access, you know, um, looking at, um, you know, various models of implementing e-invoicing. Um, I've, I've, I've had, uh, I've been working recently or I've seen uh, um, a, a, an RFP come out from a revenue authority in Southern Africa recently that's also looking at um, uh, how do they implement uh, an e-invoicing solution, but also how do they how, how do they now use all of this data to then do an automated um, an automated VAT return? Um, so I just found it um, quite interesting and um, yeah, uh, uh, loving it. I'm loving the innovation, and um, I believe that this, if done right, will really um, benefit our our revenue authorities across the continent. Um, yeah, excited to listen to the to 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 to, to the webinar and um, to get to to get everyone's thoughts. Okay, thank you very much, Sumi, and uh, uh, we hope uh, to also get more questions. And then, uh, hopefully, by the time we leave here, would have answered all the various questions or the niggling thoughts on people's mind after this. So, thank you very much. So, as we all know, why we are here today, uh, mostly about uh, e-invoicing, the implementation, and the, all the technicalities, and trying to answer all the questions that you may have. And then this uh, e-invoicing forms part of the government's 
uh, government of Ghana's main digitization agenda, uh, which we all know was facilitated or enhanced during the uh, uh, COVID crisis, and that what did not stop, but then the revenue authorities found ways to continue providing uh, services to taxpayers. And uh, as part of the general digitization agenda, we can see Jerry has taken a lot of uh, leaps and bounds. And in this case, uh, taxpayers are now having to adapt because the revenue authority is driving the digitization agenda in, in this instance. And so we are aware that currently you can file your tax returns online. And very recently, the Ghana Revenue Authority has also started providing uh, tax clearance certificates online. So this uh, VAT uh, e-invoicing uh, uh, digitization agenda is not alone. It's not in a silo, but it forms part of a broader spectrum. And then if you look at how we are going, eventually the main ways by which we know as taxpayers uh, we comply with the laws will be changing. And as a, a taxpayer, uh, you, your systems, how you do business, your processes and your flows will also need to adapt in this instance. Um, it leaves very little room for errors, uh, as uh, uh, we can see, because there's a real-time uh, uh, um, update of information and uh, in terms of invoicing or uh, um, revenue flows to uh, the revenue authority. And so we can also see the various uh, phases or iterations that VAT law has taken in Ghana. Uh, we can look far back as 1995 when VAT came in place to uh, um, change the sales and services tax regime. It came back in 98 after some re-education, et cetera. And then we can look further along the line when we had the Act 456 and later on, which became Act 870. And so VAT has seen various changes over the time, but with this system coming in place, it is a much more drastic, significant change that uh, taxpayers need to manage very well to avoid uh, disruptions or flows to their businesses. Um, of course, government wants to raise revenue, but revenue is not going to be raised if you, the taxpayer, you're not working um, to produce income. And then lastly, we've also seen various changes in terms of the 3%, we saw 5% input tax deduction uh, being changing, uh, change, the decoupling of the health insurance levies, COVID levies, etc., from the VAT. So you all agree that VAT uh, has been on agenda at each and every time uh, when we see changes. And this one coming here, it's of a much more significant and uh, drastic uh, change. Uh, eventually, the way we've seen how this e-invoicing is going and how other countries have done it, um, it's possible if you look down along the line in three or four years time, um, I, I don't think uh, VAT returns might be become uh, obsolete because if the revenue authority is seen on a real-time basis all your invoices you are raising, at the end of the month, it's possible, it should be possible for GRA to say, hey, this is your VAT return, sign it and uh, give it to me because they've already uh, seen everything. And also we are looking at how it's going to affect or change tax audits because instead of waiting three years or four years down the line, uh, th that might not be necessary. They've seen every GRA has seen on a real-time basis, on a daily basis, all your invoices that you've raised. If there are any issues, you wouldn't have a lag time of three or four years before you change it. It should have been rectified or corrected uh, within a day or possibly a month or so. So there are positives for both sides, but as any change uh, system implementer will tell you, uh, changes come with difficult questions. It comes with adjustments. And you need to be ready to be able to adjust and adapt to that change with the summit. So uh, it's, uh, uh, it's within this various themes or thinking that we are all here today to learn, to listen, to deliberate, uh, and to how, how to make sure that we don't uh, have disruptions to our flow, but then we'll seamlessly integrate with this invoicing as we are discussing. So we are very privileged uh, to have with us today, uh, Mr. Philip Akwa, uh, as Lovejoy earlier um, shared with us. Um, he, he's, he has a lot of experience. Uh, he's very busy, but he's made time to be with us because he also sees this as a, a very important exercise. And then he's here with us to 
share their process and how they're handling it and then uh, answer questions. So um, I'm sure if you've not even heard of his name, Philip Akwa, you'd have heard of his uh, impact uh, across the market because every tax person or taxpayer that I've seen clients, it's at the top of their minds and they ask questions. Um, the e, yeah, but from the tax administrator, the lead implementer himself, uh, to share his views with us. So, Philip, uh, please take over. Thank you. I think Philip is on mute. Can, can. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, and good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gideon, for that wonderful welcome remarks. You've made my job uh, very, very easy. In fact, uh, you've summarized it very well. Uh, we're here today to talk about electronic invoicing. And uh, I have a few items on the agenda to walk you through. And hopefully by the end of this session, uh, you would have uh, become uh, you know, much more knowledgeable than you were before the session on uh, electronic invoicing. So with that, I have uh, about 30 minutes to do this delivery. Uh, and I'll walk you through a um, few items here. First is uh, we'll, we'll talk about what electronic invoicing is. And then we'll look at why, we are, why GRE is introducing this technology then walk you through uh, what the benefits of electronic invoicing is, uh, the architecture behind the, uh, the technology. And then we'll look at uh, how the technology works before we dive into the implementation roadmap to date. Basically, what have we done as far as implementation of this system is concerned? Then, um, I believe that this would be a question that will be asked by a taxpayer. So I, I said, okay, why don't we look at how a taxpayer can register on the, uh, on the electronic invoicing system? Then we'll, we'll talk about compliance and monitoring aspects of the technology. Then we'll move on to questions and answers. So what is electronic invoicing? So just a bit of context. Uh, Currently, Commissioner General under the Act, the A70 Act, the main means of issuing invoices is uh, paper-based, so which is the manual invoicing regime. So Commissioner General gives you a booklet uh, with uh, invoices and then you know original copy, uh, duplicates and triplicates. And so if you want to issue an invoice, you go ahead, you write and then you give it to your customer. You keep the duplicates and the triplicates, and then uh, you use the, those to submit your returns. Now, uh, if you want to uh, have your own system and you want to use that system to, invoicing system to issue an invoice, you have to apply to the Commissioner General for a dispensation, which is a deviation from Commissioner General's mandate to use a manual invoicing system or the manual invoicing booklet. So those taxpayers who apply for dispensation will have to renew that dispensation annually. So this is how the current framework of the VAT invoicing system works. Now, electronic invoicing system is basically now making the issuance of invoices using an electronic means the default or mandatory. So now, uh, what Commissioner General is saying is that uh, I'm taking away the manual invoice booklet from you and I'm asking you to issue an invoice electronically. And Commissioner General or GRA is appending uh, a signature on the invoices in real time or near real time so that every single invoice that you issue will be what we call certified by GRA. And by certification, we mean the appending of the signature on by Commissioner General or by uh, the authority on those invoices. That 
is what identifies that invoice as certified. And there's a whole certification process that taxpayers go through in order to make their invoicing system certified uh, for the purpose of issuing invoices. So in a nutshell, this is what the e-invoicing system is. That is uh, issuing invoices electronically where Commissioner General appends his signature on those invoices in real time and near real time. So why e-invoicing? Why are we introducing this system or this technology? So I'll walk you through, and this list is not exhaustive uh, in itself. I'll walk you through uh, just six uh, items that we've listed on here as to one of the as to the main reasons why we're introducing this system. One is forgery of invoices. Now we are aware that there are a number of print houses in the country that issue fake value books or fake manual invoices. And some taxpayers go there, pick, uh, pick those invoices. And even uh, businesses that are not registered for VAT, pick these invoices and use, collect the VAT and don't remit to GRA. And this is a major problem that we have in administering VAT in the country. We also have what we call CADN, CADN of invoices, where a CAD or a, a CAD board is inserted between uh, the original invoice, uh, the original invoice and the duplicates, and a, a, a higher amount is entered on the original manual invoice. And once you, the customer is given that original manual invoice and the VAT on that is paid, a lower amount is now entered on the duplicates uh, to reduce the amount of VAT that has to be paid to the authority. We also have, in most cases, one of these two issues that we've listed together with many other cases result in overstatement of inputs and understatement of output. And we all know uh, the reason why a taxpayer or a particular taxpayer will want to do that. Overstating their input means they reduce their VAT tax liability. And of course, understating their output means the same thing. So we want to come up with a, a system that cures this, uh, these problems that we've listed, including the cost of uh, tax audits. I mean, a number of our auditors have come to taxpayers' premises, premises where they've been informed we go to a room uh, full of uh, value books when they go to do the audit. The question is, where do you even start from, right? And never an effective way of auditing, let alone not, not to talk about the costs and how, how long it takes to do that. And also that lack of data for effective compliance. So with a manual in regime, it's extremely difficult to gather data to inform the compliance direction that we take as an authority. So therefore we have listed a number of benefits of the system both to the, uh, the both to the taxpayer and also to GRA. Now, in addition to having a system like this that solves most of the challenges that we have uh, we have looked at previously on the previous slide, these are a number of benefits that we have listed on here. One is we want to create a fair and equitable VAT regime. We have received several letters where taxpayers are complaining that uh, they sell similar items where their competitors, their competitors are not registered for VAT, they are registered for VAT. This does not create a fair competition in this industry or, or sector that they operate in. But this system, we, we are hoping to curb this problem by creating a fair and equitable VAT regime. We also want to streamline the refund process. Now, because the issuance of invoices is real-time, near real-time, GRA uh, sees all the invoices that you issue as a taxpayer and invoices that are uh, issued to you, we know in real-time, near real-time, what your refund or credit position should be. So that in processing your credit position or your refund, that process will be seamless. So 
We also want to reduce the cost of compliance, the compliance burden. Uh, the time it takes for you to file your VAT returns, compile all the data that you need to uh, under the manual regime to file your VAT, VAT return, uh, cost you so much time and not only that money as well. So what we want to do is we want to reduce that burden that you currently have by providing you with a system that allows you to seamlessly file your VAT returns, saving you time and money. And what the system would do ultimately is, and I believe that uh, this was mentioned earlier on uh, in the welcome remarks by Gideon, where he talked about the future uh, where your returns could effectively be pre-populated for you so that what you do is you just go review that return and it's just a matter of clicking a button to say I agree with the returns as populated by the authority, saving you significant time and money. So that's, the, that's how the future looks like with this system. We also want to enhance record keeping uh, by introducing this system. Currently, if you issue an invoice, a manual invoice, you have to wait. You just send it by mail or give it to someone to uh, send to give to your customers and the rest of it. With this system, you issue an invoice and in real time, your customer can get that invoice, uh, reducing the, uh, you know, the time that it takes you to receive your, your, your receivable from your customers. And not only that, also, ensure that the invoices have actually been uh, sent to the customers that you have issued the invoices to. And this all helps to save and facilitate uh, the audits work that we do, both for the taxpayer and also for the authority. So what is the architecture behind this technology? So I'll walk you through the architecture in terms of how the technology works. Uh, so, and this screen here, it's kind of a busy screen, but follow through with me here. On the purple here, side here, is where the Commissioner General's invoicing system sits. So this purple is Commissioner General's certified invoicing system. That sits on GRE server. On the left-hand side, we have taxpayer systems. So the green is for those taxpayers who already have their systems. So it could be a taxpayer that has an enterprise resource planning system, for, for example, Microsoft, Navision, Hyperion, Oracle, um, could be QuickBooks, could be any ERP system. And we also have taxpayers who have their own point of sale. And then some also have their own accounting software, cash register and the like. So for these taxpayers, what we do is we provide them with what we call application programming interface, API, so that they can configure their system to communicate to Commissioner General System, which is a purple screen that you have, we, we have here. So that in real time and near real time, that communication is what facilitates the stamping of invoices that these taxpayers on the green section here are issuing. For, on the, for the taxpayers that belong to this section here, those are taxpayers that issue manual invoices currently. So for those taxpayers, we, or the authority provides them with a free invoicing software or an invoicing software for use, and it's free of charge. Now, we've done this in consultation with a number of taxpayers that we've engaged since the introduction of the system. Realize that for taxpayers who use the, or issue manual invoices, uh, some of them complained that they don't want to purchase an invoicing system because they are not ready to do so. We said, okay, we we'll prov provide you with a free invoicing system. And we also realized that some of these taxpayers have different needs. Some of them operate in an offline mode, which means they don't want to connect to the internet 24 hours Day. So we provided a desktop version of a free invoicing system to this group of taxpayers. There are also some taxpayers who are more, who move and sell their business on the go. So for these taxpayers, we made available the mobile version of this free invoicing system to them. 
And then the third, uh, the third option is the web browser or the, the, the URL of the same invoicing system. So we've provided an online version of the free invoicing system so that, for example, you're an accountant, you're a lawyer, you have access to internet, and you want to issue an invoice on the go, you can just open your laptop, uh, get the web link, pop it into your web browser and issue an invoice from there. And all of this, the data that's issued, that's, that comes in from either the free invoicing system or the, uh, the, the own invoicing systems, which is the ERP and the POSs and the rest, all that data find its way into the commissioner generous invoicing system. So which allows us to see in real time or near real time, the invoices that are issued. And we'll walk, I'll walk you through the amendment of the VAT Act and what we have done with respect to that, i.e. ensuring that taxpayers continuously ensure that their systems are integrated into commission generous investment system. Now, ultimately the data that sits on this uh, purple screen here will find its way onto the taxpayer portal, which is what we see on the top left corner here to facilitate the filing of returns. That top left hand corner is basically the TASPIA portal that we currently know. So the data would then move to that TASPIA portal to facilitate the, uh, the population of the return for uh, return filing purposes. And then GRA also is able to monitor in real time or near real time, the data that is coming in from the TASPIA send, whether that, uh, that system is uh, free invoicing system or is a taxpayer's own system that's integrated into commercial generous invoicing system. So we'll go through how the technology works. So on this screen here, we see an example of a taxpayer who has his own invoicing system and issuing an invoice. If you can follow uh, the number series here, number one, two, three, up to six here. Basically what that is doing is just walking you through the process of issuing an invoice by a taxpayer who already has his own system. The purple here again is the same purple screen that we showed over there, which shows that the Commissioner General's invoice system connects to the various taxpayer systems or the free invoicing system. So you have a POS system, in this case, we let's call it Danmark uh, Enterprise. So Danmark Enterprise has uh, his own POS or point of sale system. After the, he has integrated his system to commercial generous invoicing system, and he comes into the shop to sell. The first thing he does is he logs onto his system and he connects to his system to, it connects the system to the internet. What that does is immediately his system then brings or makes a call to Commission General's invoicing system to obtain a key. That's the first step that we have here, number one. So once he obtains a key, the key is then given or sent back to the POS system. This is what we call the handshake. So the ring takes place and then the commercial generation system then returns to the POS a key or a signature key. That signature key is simply a series of characters or a, a bunch of numbers that are sent to the server of Dan's POS system. At that point, a customer comes in to purchase and the teller punches whatever it is onto the POS system. Once the teller finishes the scanning of all the items on the system, before the teller prints that invoice, the signature key that was obtained communicates to the POS and tells it that you need to append these signatures on the receipt or the invoice. So, and that happens within a split second. So the in receipt or the invoice is appended with a series of signature, including barcode, QR, uh, which has a QR code on it. 
and then also SDC numbers and I'll show you when we when we go to that slide. And then that receipt is given to the customer. That receipt now becomes a certified receipt or certified invoice before it's given to the customer. The data then now flows back to the backend or the commercial generating system. That data or the, the transaction that took place is sent to the commercial generating system to be stored onto that system. So that's effectively how this works for those taskers who already have their system. For taskers who do not have their own systems or currently using manual invoices to issue um, invoices to customers, the system that we give to them is already pre-certified, which means that system is already embedded within it, the commissioner generous invoicing system, so that all the invoices that are issued are uh, basically certified. They don't have to go through integration. So we're just giving an example of that scenario here. So in such a case, all you need is that desktop or laptop that you just need to download the software on because that's what GRA is providing. GRA is only providing you with a software. You download that software onto your POS, onto your system, either a desktop or a laptop. You may want to connect a printer to it if you want to print the receipt or the output. So once you log in, immediately it sends a, a rings to the backend of the system, similar to computer generate, similar to what we looked at earlier on you obtain the key and you can go ahead and start selling or serving your customers. The invoices that are issued are already pre-certified. So the process is much more simpler and straightforward than those who do integration. Though the integration is also a simple process. So for all the invoices that the, this particular task issues, Mary Wine Shop, where they sell wines and the rest of it, all the invoices that they issue or are issued by Mary is or will be certified by Commissioner General in real time or near real time. So, so that's how the free invoicing system works. So question that will come up is what have we done as far as the implementation of this system is concerned? I'll walk you through uh, four main uh, elements of items that we've looked at uh, to date. First, we have amended the VAT Act, and now the Act as amended is the 1082 Act 2022. In effect, what we've done is we have made the issuance of certified invoice mandatory, and that's the default uh, you know, with the amendment of this Act. So the act says that a tax person shall issue a tax invoice through a certified invoicing system. So in a, in a sense, a certified invoicing system is the taxpayer's invoicing system that's certified by GRA. Now in certifying your invoice, you have to go through integration like I explained before. So once your system is certified, uh, you do the integration. Once you do the integration, your system is certified. So you now have to issue an invoice through this certified invoicing system. Two, you have to ensure that the certified invoicing system of the task force person is integrated into the certified into the invoicing system of the Commissioner General. So the purple section of the screen that we looked at is Commissioner General's invoicing system. So the taxpayer has to make sure that their system or their certified invoicing system is integrated into the invoicing system of the Commissioner General, which is a purple screen. So that's in effect what this law mandates taxpayers to do. First, you have to issue an invoice through a certified invoicing system. And two, ensure that that certified invoicing system is integrated into Commissioner General's invoicing system. We have also conducted several stakeholder engagement and of course, this one is not an exception. We've done several engagements beginning this year to date. And we'll continue to do so, engaging taxpayers, educating taxpayers, and answer any questions that they may have. Now, in developing the system, we took on board the comments, concerns, and questions that we received from the various taxpayer engagements that we uh, have done to date. 
And that is how we are able to come up with these three main uh, applications that we currently have. One is the free invoicing system that we talked about earlier on. Two is application programming interface for different types of task payer systems that Tapis have. And then the third one is also a certification process for third party software developers. So we envisage that there will be software developers who are currently developing invoicing systems who may want to sell those invoicing systems to task payers at some point. So we are developing a certification process that will allow those invoicing systems developed by third parties to be certified by the authority so that taxpayers can just go there and purchase those certified invoicing system for use. It will work almost in the same way as the free invoicing system, just that for these particular software, you have to pay because they are developed by third parties. And then we also have set the implementation timeline, wherein we have uh, the phase one, the phase two, and phase three. We started with 50 taxpayers and for a goal live date of October 1st. Uh, phase one, we're looking at 600 taxpayers by Q1 2022, uh, 2023. And then we're looking at about 1,000 taxpayers uh, in the next phase, which is Q4 2023. And then the, all other taxpayers by Q, uh, Q4 2024. So by Q4 2024, we hope to have finished the implementation of this system to all taxpayer groups. Now, I wanted to give you a sneak peek of the VAT Act as amended as we are looking at this. So the Act is uh, the 10, uh, 1082, and was only assented to um, this year, uh, October, somewhere in October 2022. So in effect, the, I'll just quickly read through this, I touched on this earlier on. What this is saying is that the issue of a tax invoice or sales receipt, except as otherwise provided in this act, a taxable person shall, or making a taxable supplier of goods and services, issue to the recipient a tax invoice in the form and with the details of, uh, or with the details that are prescribed by the Commissioner General. Uh, a taxable person shall issue a tax invoice through a certified invoicing system and ensure that the certified invoicing system of the taxable person is integrated into the invoicing system of the Commissioner General. So this is what we looked at earlier on. Now, there are some punitive measures here for failure to uh, do a number of things with respect to the issuance of certified invoice. So if a taxpayer fails to issue a sales receipt or fails to issue a tax invoice uh, as prescribed by the act, or if a taxpayer fails to issue a tax invoice through a certified invoicing system, contrary to section, subsection two, tempers manipulate or interferes with the proper functioning of a certified invoicing system, or fails to integrate the invoicing system of the tax person into the invoicing system of the commissioner general, contrary to subsection two, or fails to connect the certified invoicing system of that person to the invoicing system of the Commissioner General, contrary to subsection nine, then these sections apply. Of course, the intention here is not to, um, not to, is the intention here is not to punish taxpayers for not complying. We want all taxpayers to comply. That's why we come up with a system that uh, is easy, that meets taxpayers at different levels of interest. So how do you register to issue an electronic invoice? I went through the implementation phases and I described how we are implementing this uh, solution. However, a taxpayer is free to contact the GRA uh, to voluntarily register to be brought onto the system. It's a three-stage process. Uh, first, uh, a taxpayer is to connect, uh, is to contact GRA support desk and I'll give the numbers uh, during our Q&A session uh, and ensure that, and also ask questions as to what the system is about, if they have any. And then the, the, that taxpayer will be connected to our technical uh, people who are ready to also assist. Once that contact takes place, you will be con you'll, you'll, you'll go through a series of questions 
and you'll be assigned a relationship manager who will help you to be onboarded onto the system. Once you're onboarded onto the system, based on the system that you use, whether you currently have your own ERP or POS system, or you want to use a free invoicing system, you, once you're onboarded, you start issuing invoices. Now, I want to highlight here that if you have your own enterprise resource planning or point of sale system, you will simply go through uh, integration by way of us providing you with the API. You do the configuration of your system, you connect your system, commercial general system, and then you do a UAT, user acceptance testing. You go live, and there's a need for us to visit you. demonstration of the system to you, allow you to ask questions. And this all will take place with your assigned relationship manager from GRA, together with the technical people who are helping you to do that. Uh, and then you also, they will also train you on the system, how the system works, allow you to ask questions. And then they set up uh, you on your system, you do a UAT, it's very simple UAT, and then you go live. So that's how the process works, very, very simple. It's not complicated at all. So anyone who is familiar with this, the electronic invoice system, system will agree with me that the system on its own without a robust compliance and monitoring to really becomes very difficult to, uh, for us to gain the benefit that we want to gain. So we have devised three compliance and monitoring tools that come with the implementation of the solution. One, is what we call the heartbeat. Two is the revenue monitoring, and three is verification. The, hub, the heartbeat is, in essence, uh, the purple screen that we saw there, which is basically the, the, the system that allows GRA to see in real time or near real time invoices that are issued by taxpayers. So that if there are any invoices that are not coming through the system, GRA would know. Or if at any point in time, taxpayer system is down, GRA would know. If at any point in time, taxpayer has shut down this, their system and it's not connected to the commission general system, GRA would know. It's basically called a heartbeat for a reason. It means we're able to monitor the heartbeat of the taxpayer systems that they are using to issue an invoice in real time or near real time, sitting at the head office in GRA. We also have a revenue monitoring tool that's embedded within system, the system, which allows us to see how much revenue is coming in, how much uh, refunds are due to the taxpayer, how many invoices have been issued by, by this taxpayer at any point in time, and the corresponding VAT, the invoice amount, and the rest, up to the details of the invoice. So if you went to Melcom to purchase a uh, laptop or whatever it is, we're able to even see to that extent the items on that invoice that you purchased, uh, the items that you purchased that are listed on that invoice. There's also a verification tool that comes with the system, which allows taxpayers or anyone to be able to scan using a simple QR code scanner to verify an invoice or receipt to confirm that indeed this invoice or receipt is issued by GRA or has been approved by GRA. So I just wanted to give you a sneak peek of how the heartbeat looks like. So this, one, this screen here tells us that all those uh, taxpayers that are, uh, that, are, that are lighted green here are those taxpayers who are currently live issuing an invoice. And this is just a, a snippet of the live system showing us that the, all those in green are issuing invoices and they are live at that point. We're able to see uh, taxpayers who are live in the last two hours last four hours, last eight hours, and last 12 hours, and last 24 hours. So that if you are a company that we know operate between nine to five, and within the last 24 hours, you have not come online, the system is able to tell us. So we're able to query and send you a test using the system to say, what, what, what is going on? Why have you not opened your shop? We haven't seen any data coming in. For taxpayers that operate offline, they may be shown as red here, meaning they have not come online within, within the last 12 hours. However, we know that they are operating offline. So they will have the data that they have stored while operating offline, ready to be downloaded to us once they come online. So this gives us 
a real time uh, monitoring of what a taxpayer is doing on the end, which allows us to see if any taxpayer is online, offline, and if they are issuing invoices or not. So there's also the revenue monitoring piece, which allows us to see which invoices are issued by taxpayers at any point in time. So what we see here, where you have the, uh, the arrow pointing down, is showing us that this particular company issued an invoice on this date, uh, on the 25th of September at this time. The amount on the invoice is 511 CDs and 56 uh, uh, cents. And we're able to view that invoice and be able to see the details of that particular invoice that were issued together with the taxes that were uh, charged or applied on the invoice. So we see over here that this taxpayer sold basket plastic fancy uh, container set of GPS uh, solitaire and then bowl set of uh, white cups, spoons, and the rest of it. We see, we see the unit price, the quantity, the amount, and also see the the total amount, the taxable, uh, what, how much was taxable, the exempt, the VAT, the NHL get fund COVID withholding and the rest. We're able to see all of that on that invoice. And the taxpayer is also, also has a copy of this invoice as we are showing on the screen. So this here is the security system of this, uh, uh, security feature of the system, which allows uh, this data to be, which is encrypted, to be decrypted by us giving a you and unique code to be able to decrypt this data. Once you de decrypt this, the, it will show you the invoice that was issued by this particular taxpayer. So these are security features that are embedded within the system. Now the system also allows us to do verification and the verification can be done by uh, the end consumer, it can be done by a taxpayers or can be done by a GRA staff. So an invoice like this, if you scan the QR code, a pop-up will come that will tell you if this invoice is certified by GRA or it's not. Now you will see over here, SDC, SDC number, the receipt number, MCR time, MCR, and all of these are the data that the signature key gives to the taxpayer once the taxpayer connects to commercial generous invoicing system, which makes this invoice unique. Everything else from here up to the top is the taxpayer detail. We don't touch any of that. All we do is we handshake our system with yours uh, and then we just append signature on your invoice before you give to the customer. So the content of your invoice remain the same. We do uh, validation of certain items. For example, if the item that you have declared as exempt should really indeed be exempt, we do validation of that at the back end. However, we only make sure that we are pending the signature uh, on the invoice to make sure that we uh, this invoice can be verified by anyone at any point in time. So if you have an invoice structure like this, you will continue to maintain the invoice structure. All we do is just append the signature on that invoice. And once you scan an invoice, if the invoice is verified, it will tell you with a verification sign, as you can see on this screen, that this invoice is verified by GRA. And the data that uh, is sent to us is also maintained on our, on our portal which allows us to see all invoices that have been verified by any particular taxpayer, end consumer, or GRE staff. And it allows us to follow up where an invoice has been scanned and not been verified, but that particular taxpayer has been onboarded onto the system. So part of what we're doing is we're going to have a publication of all the taxpayers that have gone live on the GRE website. So that if you want to verify an invoice, let's say you go to Malcolm Kanishi and you bought something and you are not sure if Malcolm Kanishi has gone live, go to our website, you see that list there. And then you'll be able to verify that indeed, uh, this taxpayer has gone live. But how come when I try to verify, I'm not able to verify, I'm not receiving the verification uh, response or the badge uh, on the invoice. And once you do that, that response will be sent to GRA. 
So this is the verification screen that we have we see on the on the GRA and when any person tries to verify an invoice. And what we are introducing also is we're introducing a reward program that allows taxpayers to be able to and consumers to be able to win a reward for uh, we, are, we are able to win a reward for verifying invoices. So once an invoice is verified, you will see on the GRS and a check mark on that particular invoice that was scanned by the person who verified that invoice. And we see, okay, this invoice was issued in this case by GPHA, is verified by, by GRA. And in this case, we just had a test case where we say, okay, this invoice was verified by this person and it tells us the amount and the rest of it. If that invoice that was scanned is for whatever reason not verified, the system will also tell us, which is this screen here. So we receive a list of all the invoices that have not been verified. You can see over here, what we ask for the person who scanned that invoice is their phone number and the name of the taxpayer so that we can follow up and make sure that indeed this invoice uh, that was not verified was issued outside of the invoicing system, even though this particular taxpayer uh, has been onboarded onto the system. And then at that point, all the sanctions that should apply, as we read in the earlier slide, will apply in that case. So this system gives us a 360 degree view of the entire VAT invoice, invoicing uh, landscape. So all invoices that are issued are within the purview of GRA if you are connected or when you are connected onto the invoicing system up to the very detail of items that are purchased on that invoice. If that invoice is exempt, it's exempt we're, uh, the item on the invoice is exempt, we're able to see it, we're able to validate that indeed this item should be exempted. And if a, an invoice is scanned and the invoice is not verified, we're also able to see and able to follow up with the taxpayer. We're introducing a reward program or a raffle where uh, end consumers can earn a reward for uh, scanning the receipt or the invoice. And those rewards will either be be drawn monthly, quarterly, yearly, and the rest. We are planning for an instant reward for us, uh, end consumers to also win, uh, you know, could be MTN credits, uh, could be install uh, credits and the rest of it. So once you win an install credit, you can take, take it to Mr. Malcolm uh, to redeem that, that, that reward. And, and this is part of uh, the uh, assurance that we're sort of adding to the system, make sure that this, you know, the system works and is able to achieve the intended objectives that we wanted to achieve. If you are a B2B uh, customer and you want to claim an input, you will need to give your TIN number to the, uh, the business that's issuing the invoice so that that invoice would show on your taxpayer portal if you have been onboarded onto the system. If you're a B2C customer and you go and purchase something, you do not necessarily need to provide the, uh, the, the, the business with your, uh, your TIN or Ghana card number. However, if you want to participate in the monthly draw or the quarterly draw or the reward program that we're introducing, then you will need to provide your, your details to the business that you are doing uh, that particular business with so that you'll be put into a draw. So when you win, we have a way of contacting you. So I will bring this uh, presentation to an end and uh, we can proceed. And if there are any questions, we'll take those questions from there. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, you've made a very difficult or complex topic or subject very easy. In fact, if you've not thought of being a, a lecturer, I'll ask that please, we need you to start lecture like, because the time just flew by and I didn't even know who we've gone by. So thank you very much for the very, very detailed explanations you provided. Um, a couple of things caught my mind, but before I come there, we have another poll for the participants to take uh, before we go to the questions. So please, um, can you show the uh, poll? Okay. With the options available, how will you adapt the electronic VAT invoicing system.
Okay. So while the audience votes, um, I think a couple of things caught my eye. The first one is the raffle. Um, I'm very much interested to win uh, some items. So I'll be duly participating in that. And also very important as a task consultant, another area which comes up very often is the issue of tax refund. By seems with this e-invoicing, it's going to be a much more simpler process. Uh, as we shared earlier, the tax authority knows what is going on on a daily basis. So uh, getting a tax refund shouldn't be uh, a laborious process. Also for tax payers, another benefit I noticed is a compliance time reduced, which means in terms of money, uh, the manual processes is reduced and errors, etc. I've seen a couple of taxpayers where the accountants do not rightly prepare this uh, VAT filing on a monthly basis work. Well, they mix it up and it causes problems later. So this should reduce the errors. And also with this, you mentioned that with the new act now, certified invoicing is now mandatory. So all taxpayers have to note this is mandatory. And another part I like is the fact that GRA will be providing training uh, as part of this whole uh, process implementation. So this is very much welcome so thank you very much uh, philip um i wanted to say oh, those who want to go ahead can start asking the questions before the panelists sit but we do have a lot of questions fortunately as you were going through you are uh, managed to answer some of the questions but we'll come back to the questions and answers later so please feel free uh, if you're in the audience to put your questions under the q a there are quite a number now uh, over 40 questions uh, but some have been answered but we'll attack uh, the others so at this juncture, um, uh, we'll approach the other panelists in terms of our lead partner, tax partner, George, and then our senior manager, uh, Edward. So I can start with uh, our lead tax partner, George. So um, if I'm a, a taxpayer listening to this and I've heard that some uh, entities were closed down as a result, um, and I know I have issues. Uh, I may have to talk to my head office based in some country in the Middle East. Uh, the processes is slow. GRA has approached me now. What options? What do I do? I don't want my shop to be closed. How do I best handle this? Okay. Thank you, Gideon. Um, I think that from the presentation from um, Mr. Flipakwa, it is clear that this is a process. The GRA does not just get up when we come to you and say that today, today, you need to hook on, you have not done it, and so we are closing your shop. There is communication, and so there's a need for more engagement. So if you are supposed to do this, and now we are all aware that every taxpayer is actually supposed to do the e-invoicing. And so this is the time for you to start engaging your head office if you don't have absolute control over the systems and what you need to do, you need certain approvals to engage with your head office or regional office or whoever you need to consult with internally from your business side. And then also engage with the GRE that, look, this is where we are. And I put in place to be able to ensure that we comply. Without communication, without engagement, you create challenges because the GRE has the mandate to ensure that this um, whole invoicing system is implemented. So if you're a business and you don't communicate with them, you don't get to them for them to appreciate where you stand. I have had an instance of engaging the GRA of a business that the GRA closed up because the GRA got to a point of um, understanding that they have engaged and they were not getting um, their way around. And so they had to, and a number of shops were actually closed down as some of you may be aware. Okay, but these shops were subsequently opened because they engaged the GRA subsequently. And the GRA, as far as I know, even now, that some of these business that they have opened and they are treated have not fully gone in terms of full implementation, but they have put in the process and they are working with the GRA. Um, it can take quite a number of weeks um, from, from what I, I've gotten from, from my interactions with a GRE, it can take some weeks or even months to get this done. And so what's important for me as, as a taxpayer is engagement. Engagement within your business where you need approvals or you need some communications, you need some systems to be set up to allow you to be able to get 
the in invoicing system done on your side. And also letting the GRA be aware of what you are doing, the efforts you are putting in and not keeping them in the dark because the perception of not getting your cooperation then uh, makes it like you are not allowing the authority to um, sort of do what their mandate requires them to do. And so it's more of communication um, from, from the business side. And I think that once you, you engage the GRA, from my experience, uh, they, they listen. It is when we don't engage, then we, we tend to have some sort of difficulties as far as this invoicing system is concerned. Okay, thank you very much, uh, George. And so the next question is to Edward. Um, so we understand for some companies or some of the concerns shared, even with the, one of the questions here, companies with concerns around data privacy and cybersecurity, is it possible to outsource the e-invoicing process and what are the pros and cons to consider for each option? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Gideon, for the question. And also thanks to my honorable members who have made impact on the delivery today. So basically we are here because of uh, technology and the um, GRA can now have extensive um, interactions with uh, operating platforms for various uh, tax spheres because of the availability of technology. I don't believe that GRA is operating outside the laws of um, um, what we call data protection acts that the whole government has been drumming across the nation for quite a while. So somebody was asking if they give access to GRA in an integration uh, form, form and they now be able to pick the required data for the process of bit and bat, are they going to see only the bad data or other data sitting within my 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 um, systems? The the clarity is is there. The GRA um, have man have been mandated to do things, and they're doing things within a framework that does not infringe on the data protection rights of the um, institution. So yes, they will even if they have access to your systems, it will be according to data protection acts of which there that we have a commission in Ghana taking care of that. So clients should not be worried about that. But if still customers or um, taxpayers believe that they would want to have it, another option for them to look at in the sense that they think they will be uh, more at heart, there is also other options. So the commissioner mentioned other options that you can have access to being able to get your VAT EVAT done. You also have an option of actually handing your data processing and submission and then the return data to a third party like Deloitte who might have a mediating platform that can sit between yours and GRA so that you are not actually talking to GRA system but you are talking to a trusted partner like Deloitte where we can now take your input data, process it to the format where GRA wants get the verifications, sign off, and then deliver back to your systems for you. If that's the option that you want, I think um, we are a trusted uh, partner for that. And our system will also be certified by um, uh, GRE to be sure that we're doing exactly what they want us to do. And when our customers are being verified, they will know that the system has actually done the work that is required according to the framework for the EVAT solution. So clients should be clear on all the options I think we have four options now. The free one, um, the integrated one, which you use APIs to connect from your backend accounting solution or ERP systems to GRA. You also have a third party software that has the um, um, processing of the EVAD embedded in it already, which they've made availability on their website. And also the last option would be, you can give to your trusted partner, for example, Deloitte to do that for you. Okay, thank you very much. I can see Philip shaking his head very much. I have a question for you. So for uh, would, I know you mentioned it briefly in your uh, presentation for would be third party uh, uh, software solution providers. What is the process uh, for them to get this accreditation from your end? And uh, do you have any at, at the moment? And if not, when, when do we get one? Yeah, so the plan is, uh that by Q1, we will publish the uh, certification process. So uh, if you look at the uh, implementation of, sorry, implementation of EVAT globally, uh, this is part of the implementation process, right? And 
at the moment, our, our uh, immediate uh, plan is to at least integrate to those who already have systems. And for those who don't have systems, we want to give them systems for use. Now, this is part of the second phase, so to speak, of the implementation, wherein we'll have a certification process and that certification pro process will be published on our website and will also be uh, published in the in in the in the in the in print uh, on on the various uh, media platforms, so that anyone at all can basically go through the education process and get their system certified. Now we also publish a list of companies that uh, we have certified their systems for use as EVAT compliant, and mind you, that list is going to be dynamic, so that if at any point in time we realize that a particular system, invoicing system that has previously been certified by GRA is compromised in any way, we would delist that from our record. And then they will have to reapply, right? So there's there, there are quite a lot of checks and balances that we put in place. But the short answer to your question is by Q1 next year, we'll have that certification process published on our website on the, on the major media platforms. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, we have, uh, for your information, we have a list of 79 questions. Um, okay. but, uh, <laughs> uh, we'll try and answer as much as possible. Some I could see uh, 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 the same, we can put them together. And then we, for those notes, I'm sure we'll find a way to provide as much uh, answers as much uh, possible. Uh, uh, George, um, what are your views? People are saying that VAT has seen so many changes, 3%, 5%. Inputs, outputs, uh, changing um, that the system now VAT on withholding, etc. Do you see that? What, what's your view on this uh, e invoice? Does it make matters more complicated, or do you think it simplifies it? Right. So thanks, Gideon, once again. Um, yes, it is true that um, since the introduction of VAT, we have seen a lot of changes, uh, flat rate to standard, standard to flat the introduction of levies combined with the VAT in terms of accounting or reporting, decoupling the levies from the VAT, and all that uh, introduction of uh, COVID levy and all that. So there has been a lot of changes. And sometimes the, the, the shortness within which the changes comes really, really uh, makes it difficult for taxpayers from where I sit as a consultant, where your, your clients uh, would have to always find a way to uh, reconfigure their system to, to be able to um, implement the changes that come. It comes with a lot of onerous challenges um, um, for, for taxpayers. Um, I have always said that there's a need for some level of consistency in terms of the regime so that people are setting when they are setting up their systems and manage the cost of implementing such systems. That now we stand, I think that with understanding that we've gotten with this um, e-invoicing system, um, I see this to be more of assurance, um, revenue assurance system that is being put in place um, for the revenue authorities. And I believe that even for um, businesses or entrepreneurs or for shareholders who probably are not always sitting with the business, if you have such a system that is being implemented, then you also even have that assurance in terms of your revenue, that everything is going through the system. And um, I think in the, in the presentation, uh, Flip did mention some of the benefits that this would even help in terms of um, your, your accounting for VAT, because unlike a situation where you wait for a tax audit to come, they want to do a reconciliation, which sometimes take a lot of efforts to do. Now the GRA is seeing your revenue um, real time in terms of what you are selling or invoices that you are issuing. So there wouldn't be the need for such a long process of reconciling your revenue because they have your revenue online. I, I am um, of the view that still there may be challenges one, one, on one or two occasions where systems are, are down. I think Philip do, um, uh, did, did alluded to the fact that they have a mechanism to see where systems are down. And so if the GRA side is down as a system and the taxpayer side is, is actually running, then the possibility of the taxpayers invoicing at that time, not reflecting at the GRA's end, 
could be an issue in terms of reconciliation and the GRE having that perception that the taxpayer is not reporting what's expected of him, whereas the taxpayer is actually doing the right thing. Um, I, I'm saying this because, for instance, we have the Praska example of the current um, um, withholding tax online withholding taxes that that we are we are working with, where the GRA has introduced. Um, a system for taxpayers to now get their tax clearance certificates online. The requirements is to ensure that you have paid all your taxes, you have paid all your taxes. We have situations we have filed taxes for our taxpayers. They have paid all the taxes online. Everything is there. You have evidence of receipts. Now getting the TCC, the report is coming out that this return has not been filed. This payment has not By the time you go and give them copies to make sure that it's corrected, say that the GRA should ensure that um, those challenges, even if they should occur, they have a mechanism to ensure that it is resolved as quickly as possible to put some level of confidence um, in the taxpayers and also to eliminate that perceived uh, non-compliance from the taxpayer side. Because I believe that this system, if it should work efficiently, should be able to enhance compliance from the VAT side and also uh, in terms of revenue um, from the from the GRE side, you'll see the right revenue. But ultimately, um, I think that it is all about how the system is going to work efficiently. It's, it's still new, it's still being monitored. Um, the, the indications I have gotten um, is that since the introduction of these businesses that were filing, say 100,000, 200,000 VAT on a monthly basis, uh, all of a sudden, a million VAT is being filed. Um, these are some of the things we are hearing from the grave as to whether it's true or not. But it is, for me, a, a monitoring system. It should not affect your compliance issues as far as VAT is concerned. You should be able to report your VAT filings as it were. But here, there is that level of assurance that your revenue reporting is on top you yourself have confidence that you have reported to the GRE and should the GRE come that you, you have not reported something, you have the evidence to show them that there's no problem with my system, if there's anything, it's your end. And so I think that um, it will enhance um, um, compliance uh, as far as uh, reporting is concerned. Okay, thank you very much, uh, George. Um, I'll answer some three questions. I've seen them uh, trying to look at the 82 questions we have now. And so somebody's asked, are we going to get the recordings of this and the presentation shared? Yes, you get the recordings. Philip, we have your uh, approval to share the presentation. Can we yes. share that? Yes, you can, yes. Okay, so we'll share this recording and we'll share the presentation after this call. Mm -hmm. The second group of questions I've been seeing is whether the system makes uh, room for a refund or cancellation. I'll say yes, based on the guidelines we've seen there, there's a process for that. If you made an error, you want to cancel, you want to partially cancel, or a, 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 a customer has returned their goods, the system makes room for you to be able to do that uh, and declare. Then the other one, uh, people are asking for the API. I think when you go on GRS website, you get a lot of information on this uh, as well. Uh, I have another question for you, Philip. So yeah. we've seen the first batch of 50 rolled out. When is the next batch uh, coming out? So uh, we're currently going through, um, uh, we're doing analysis of taxpayers by sector and by revenue, right? Uh, so some of the feedback that we received uh, when we rolled out the 50 taxpayers really hinges on, you know, I, I'm in this sector, this taxpayer is in the same sector as me, how come they have not been brought onto the, onto the system, right? Are you targeting me and the rest of it? So we're doing analysis of taxpayers by revenue, by size, and by sector. So the idea is that by Q1 uh, next year, we would have onboarded uh, 600 taxpayers. And by these, segments that I've just described uh, by sector, right? So you take all companies in, let's say, retail grocery space, 
you bring all of them together within a certain revenue threshold, right? And then you do the same for other businesses as well. So the implementation plan, I think I went through it uh, in my slides, on my slides, the implementation plan is 600 by Q1 and then 1000 uh, by Q, uh, Q4 2024, uh, 2023, and then the rest uh, by Q4 2024, the rest of task phase by Q4 2024. Now, the idea is we also want to capture about uh, 70 to 80 percent of the VAT revenue. So we're looking at where the significant uh, transactions exist, right, to be able to bring those task on board. Okay. Okay. Um, uh, Philip, just before I move away from you, Another question I, I see recurring through this is how long does this process take? Is it a week, a month, or and, and what can make this process faster and smoother for taxpayers? So there are two things. If you are doing an integration of your system to uh, the commercial generation in Western system, it can take like a day or two, depending on how complex your system is. Now, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the shops that we closed down, they wrote to us and they told us that they can only do this in 2024 because it takes a long time to integrate and the rest of it. After closing down the shops, uh, when we went in to do the integration, some of the shops, it took us less than 24 hours to do the integration, less than 24 hours. So it all depends on the company. And then also, same example, some of the shops that we closed down, some of them has taken us like three weeks. We're still going back and forth uh, doing the integration. Because every taxpayer, especially those ones that have proprietary systems, every taxpayer has a system that's unique to the environment. And they may have firewalls, which may block the integration, right? So you have to go in and find out why the system is not working as it's intended. So there's no straightforward answer to the question. It depends on the system that you use. However, if you are onboarding onto the free invoicing system, that could take about three days to finish that whole process. Okay. Because this is the this okay. is the free invoicing system that we give to you for use. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. I think another uh, group of questions I keep on seeing is uh, if you are an exempt supplier and then you happen to make a, a taxable supplier. Yeah, so I think one of the guidelines generally you should share as part of the attachments after this. It's also very clear on that. Uh, if you do a one-off supply, there's a process that you have to follow to make sure you apply the VAT correctly, even though your normal service is exempt or outside the VAT scope. Once you end up having to make, maybe you sell your furniture or equipment, there is a process that you have to follow. So that is also catered for. We'll share that the guideline here has already issued. Um, at this time, I think I'll give an opportunity to one or two. We are mindful of the time, but we're also mindful of the fact that there are pressing questions that you need. So I'll give an, uh, an opportunity to one or two persons to ask a question, to ask, ask one or two questions to our uh, panelists. So, um, who, who comes first? Um, our technical team, can you assist? Hi, Gideon. So there's Wilson Maunyo with a hand up. So Wilson, you're, you're allowed to talk now. Hello? Yeah, I am, I'm not uh, clear as to whether uh, how that, that step is going to be, be used to integrate those people who are not um, who are illiterate and who are also not technically inclined so far as computer is concerned. You know, major of a part of our suppliers are people who are pet petty traders. So in that situation, how is the system going to capture them or integrate them into the system? Okay, so uh, Wilson, if I understand your question, this is directed at uh, uh, the sellers or the business owners who are not well, uh, uh, who, who are not so educated as to be able to use this system. I yes, think sir. Philip may talk about manual system. So Philip, if you can take this question. So there, there, are, two, there are two sides to this, right? Uh, I mean, he talked about illiterate. I would assume that if you are filing your VAT returns, 
and you're currently writing the manual, you should have some level of literacy. That's the first thing, to be able to write the manual book. Unless you register for VAT by filing mail and saying you're not doing business at all. But in so far as you can write and that someone bought this and you should, you should at least have some level of literacy. I just want to make that point clear, right? So for those taxpayers who are issuing manual invoices, I just state that we are giving them an invoicing system for use. And it's a very simple invoicing system. In fact, we have taken taxpayers' concerns and needs on board in developing this free invoicing system. And the interface is very user-friendly. So all you have to do is, and our, our, our technical people can also help you, will help you to, to set you up. So for instance, you sell furniture. Let's get used as an example and you want to load your inventory on the system and put the prices of that inventory to, uh, to on, the, on the system. Our technical people, our persons can help you to do that entire setup. So if someone comes to your store, they walk you through the process, select this. If you are selling a fence, you should know the name of the items you're selling at least. You know, select this and then it will come up on the invoice and then the amount will come. And then the system will do the calculation for you. All you have to do is just print it or send it by WhatsApp by clicking the button, almost the same way as using your phone, right? So we have taken that on board to make sure that we, one, train those taxpayers that we think can or will be challenged techn uh, technologically, right? To make sure that they are aware of how to use the system. They're also, the user interface is very friendly and very easy to use. Right, so that training process is extremely important. It's a, it's a, it's a very important part of, the, of those taxpayers who are on the manual system to ensure that they're able to use the system and without any challenges. You know? So we cater for those group of taxpayers uh, you know, to ensure that they don't have any technical challenge. And by the way, if a taxpayer has any challenge, there are toll free line, toll free lines. And not only that, we create WhatsApp group for every single engagement that we have. So that if they have a, a question, they can just immediately go on the platform, type on there, oh, I have this challenge. Then someone can attend to you immediately. If there's a need for them to come to your premises, they'll come and make sure they help you to resolve whatever challenge that you have. Thank you very much. Okay, th thank you. I think the next person we have, uh, the questions are low, so we are trying to, so yeah. please when you ask your questions, Make it very brief. Ellen, please uh, ask your question. Good morning to everyone. Um, please, um, I would like to find out for the um, online or the sports betting businesses, somehow they don't you know, write the manual invoices. So for them, how are they going to issue the e invoice? Okay, thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, Philip, so for the sports betting companies, yeah. Yes. So the betting industry is a separate, we're dealing with them separately. Now, initially, uh, we were planning on bringing them onto the EVAC system. Now we had several engagements with the betting association and, you know, and the rest of it. So the conversation around that is quite extensive. We can't finish the conversation we start today. But the long, uh, the long and short of that is, I think we are bringing them in through a simplified, some sort of simplified income tax regime, right? Where we looked at their gross receipts, right? And that is currently in discussion. And uh, so within this space and within the implementation framework, they are not considered as part of the, because of the complexities around how they operate and the whole policy discussions that we're currently having. So yes, what she said is true but it's something that's currently being worked on. Okay, thanks. That's a very good question. So thank you very much, Ellen, and thanks for your response. And the next one we have is Richard. Richard, please uh, speak up. Richard. Okay, if Richard is having issues. Hi, we can... hi, hello. Hi, hello. Okay, okay. Sorry. Yes, I'd like to know if a taxpayer can volunteer to be migrated immediately ahead of the GRA schedule. I'm, I'm ready to do that. 
And then um, I just want to understand. So in the manual system, immediately you issue a, a VAT invoice, whether it's paid or not, uh, you're liable. Uh, under this system, uh, is that, that, does that uh, still, still operate? I'm, I'm, okay, I'm done. Uh, I hope you heard me. Okay. Um, I don't know if the panelists had a question, uh, or maybe you can repeat it. Just a All right. brief one. I, I, I was asking that can a taxpayer volunteer to be migrated immediately ahead of the GRA's uh, own uh, schedule? Uh, because I okay. see the benefits and I like to do that. And then okay. also, um, I know that under the manual system, as we operate, if you issue a VAT invoice, whether your client has paid or not, uh, you are liable. Uh, would that still be the case under, under the system? Okay, so maybe Phil, if you can take the first part. All right, uh, so yes, you, you can voluntarily, I think I mentioned this in my submission, maybe you have not joined us then. Yes, you can voluntarily uh, contact us to be uh, onboarded onto the system. And I'll provide the numbers uh, in, you know, so that you can basically contact us and we can start that process. Now, uh, will you take the second question or you want me to go ahead and take the second question? Okay, no, I think you can take, uh, I'll, I'll add up to your question, the answer. Okay, okay so um, in my submissions, uh, when I went through the slides, I did mention that the current process of issuing invoices and the way you account for your VAT invoices does not necessarily change, right? So nothing of the VAT, uh, you know, the, the VAT invoicing regime changes. What we're doing is just moving that manual process to an electronic process. And so the payment of the invoices, your customer paying you and when you pay your VAT, all of that stayed the same. When you look at the amendment to the VAT Act, what we did was we just changed the manual invoice uh, being the default to an electronic invoice. You know, so your customers paying you when you pay your VAT, everything is pretty much the same. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, I'm totally in agreement. So it means the rules and regulations of the VAT law is still there in terms of uh, timing of supply, place of supply, and so the VAT Act, I know a lot of people complain about it, that uh, it's sometimes you are not paid by the uh, liability arises, you have to pay 30 days afterwards. So yes, it's still the same uh, with this uh, one until the rules are changed. So thank you. Uh, do we have any other person that I can just throw a question? Somebody, there's a couple of questions around the reward system which I think is a very good idea, which means it means that the whole Ghana populace become auditors for and on behalf of the GRA. So somebody is asking whether it's perpetual or for a limited period. All right, so yeah, in fact, it's going to be quite instrumental in the implementation of this system. So initially we're planning it for two years. Um, you know, up to uh, 2024. And then depending on how, you know, the, how the participation goes, we see how, we, you know, whether we extend it or not, but initially it's for a two year period. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So uh, rewards for two years, that's very long. Hopefully I get to win one before the two year period ends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the next question is uh, Annie. Annie, please uh, ask your question. Hello. Yeah, Ani. Okay, please, can you hear me? My question yeah. is um, is about a third party or a consultant. We are consulting on behalf of a, a client and um, the client has registered or upgraded a system, integrated a system with a certified uh, pro uh, provider. At the end of the day, you go into the system. I have a practical example like that. You go into the system, you want to file a returns on behalf of the client, but then you have to go 
and change or do other things. So my question is, can GRA make independent provision for consultants or to be precise, third party, third parties who consult on behalf of other clients? Thank you. Okay, so um, Philip, uh, as I said, this question, a lot of the questions are coming your way. All right, so for, I just want to explain the third party certification process to, to provide clarity on how it works. So, for example, uh, Gideon, you, you are, let's say, uh, a systems developer and you develop uh, an invoicing system. And currently, you have not, no one is, no, no taskpayer is using your system. You just finished the development. Now, you want GRA to certify that invoicing system. So you come to GRA and you say, hey, I want you to certify the invoices, my invoicing system for me. And we'll give you the certification process. You go ahead and you, we certify your invoicing system. If, for example, if uh, George comes to you as a taskpayer and he uses your invoicing system, what he's doing is he just buying that invoicing system for you, from you as the same way as he would have bought QuickBooks, right? and he's using your invoicing system to issue an invoice. The benefit to George is that he doesn't have to go through the whole integration process right, with GRA, so he saves that time and then he buys it from you. Now, whatever invoicing system that, uh, that your invoicing system is connected to GRA's invoicing system. So as a consultant, when you, are, when you want to file for, uh, for George, all you have to do is go to you as a consultant will have a portal that GRA will give you, right, uh, for George. So you have to go to that portal, which is the Certified Invoicing System portal, which will have all the invoices that George has issued uh, from uh, Gideon system and all the invoices that have been issued to, to him. So the invoices will be in a centralized place. And eventually, that those invoices will be summed up or tallied and will be sent to the taxpayer portal for filing. So there are no complexities there at all. You know, okay. um, in terms of access to that information, we give you that, that information. And it's on the taxpayer portal that GRA gives to you as a third party consultant who is acting on behalf of, in this case, on behalf of George to file the returns for. So you don't have any issues. And so there's no need for us to make any provision, provision, right? We have already catered for that, right? You have all the invoices that have been issued to George and George has issued to other taxpayers on that portal that GRA gives to you, right? And this is different from the invoicing system, invoicing system. This is just a taxpayer portal, which is the certified invoicing system portal that each taxpayer has, which shows all the invoices they've issued and invoices that have been issued to them. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. I think there are another group of questions I've seen a lot is on the issue around the uh, internet connectivity that they up, uh, they go down and they're not working. I think those, that's also answered by the guidelines uh, issued by the GN, which we'll share after this call, uh, which sort of addresses this, what a taxpayer is supposed to do. Immediately, the systems go down. You have to contact the help desk or the WhatsApp and then GR you agree on a set of modalities. So the system or the guidelines has already considered that. So all those questions, I think we've answered that. Um, Edward, do you have anything to add, add, add to what uh, Philip has already shared? So I'll do two things basically. So earlier somebody asked about um, the fact that um, if they are illiterate and they will struggle to get acquainted with the system. So Mostly those companies that are owned by illiterate, it doesn't really mean that they are still in an illiterate era. They still have computerized systems at some point, it depends on the size of the institutions. And they bring on board technology people that come to help them to be able to fulfill various activities in their business operations. Similar to this one we have here, new regime has come that VATs are moving away from manual to um, digital. So I think it's imperative that you connect with the technology guys you've been working with to set up your IT system for you, of which we are, like we're saying that 
um, Deloitte can support you along those journey as well. We do have relationship with companies that we do quite a lot of um, outsource technology activities for. So we could be an option, depends on the size and your the, the, the capability to pay basically. And um, the one you just mentioned about internet connectivity. Um, so it being electronic means you, one, you have to stay, um, um, how do you call it, constantly connected. Or when you go offline, you can upload the ones that were backed up. I don't think it's 100% uh, 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 online. Those that can do offline mode at some point, you are able to upload data and content when you are back online. But you should trust that the um, GRA will see whether you are connected or not. When you come in, they will see. So one thing I will add on top of that is you make sure that you have a good internet service provider so that you're connected all the time. And also make sure that your secure connection to GRA is something that you have been, um, you can really get the professionals to enable you, make sure that you're connected well so that security from both sides of the of the loop would be would be secure. So basically that's my addition. And I think like um, we earlier mentioned, there are options for people to get if you are not in the know, there's place for knowledge, you have to find it. Okay, um, we'll be rounding up very soon. And so uh, I, I, I really appreciate all the questions and uh, coming up. So what you are doing is we are grouping it and we are trying to ask as much as possible. Some of the questions we know will be answered when you see either the uh, presentation or when you see the guidelines. So for those who we'll put them on the side and answer those ones that we think um, uh, will not be answered, they will answer it here. So uh, the next question is Abdul Nafiu. Hello, Abdul Nafiu Mohammed. Yes, hello, thank you, Gideon, uh, yeah. Philip Aqua, and the rest of the team. So my question uh, still borders around those who are within, uh, you know, the hinterlands with uh, little or no access to internet and or electricity. So you would find that uh, in other jurisdictions where we have e-invoicing, they do allow, you know, batch clearance as opposed to real-time clearance to cater for this type of situation. Are you looking into some of these things just to make sure that uh, small businesses in the hinterlands, are, you know, they are comfortable? Then um, also want to find out like, when would you be exposing the APIs to the public for those of us in the developer space who want to start thinking about solutions we can bring to the market? When would you be bringing this? Any timelines? Thank you. Thank you. So Philip, uh, if you can take this briefly, yeah. All right, so batch clearance. So basically, I think uh, Gideon mentioned this and uh, well, we've talked about this earlier on, that the system allows you to operate in an offline mode. So when you operate in an offline mode, what that means is we would have given you uh, a snapshot of the commercial engineering system onto your on-premise server, right? So we'll come to your physical office or physical shop or physical business premises and install a, a copy of the certified invoice system on your server so that you, whenever you're operating, you communicate in an offline mode to this cloned version of the online system, right? And that sits on your server so that you don't need to come online and operate, right? And you continue to connect and communicate to that system within that 24 hours. Now, currently, the law mandates you to come online every 24 hours. That's how the law has been crafted. Right, every 24 years. And when you come online within that 24 hours, you can upload that batch of invoices that you have uh, you have issued to the Commissioner General uh, by going online. And once you go online, the upload will start, that synchronization process will start. And then your document or your invoices will be sent in batches to the Commissioner General at that point. So we take care of that. And that's why we provide you with the on-premise solution. Now, exposing API. So currently, because we are implementing this in phases, we have the API documentation. We provide that to taskers as and when we engage them. 
but part of the process is you have that on our website, if not already there, right? And so that if you want to start engaging GRA with respect to that, what we also don't want to do is we want to control that process so that the API documentation is made available to you when you're ready to start onboarding. So for example, if you're a developer and you want to engage GRA, you can contact us on any of our support lines and we can start engaging you and then if you, so if you have any questions, it's more controlled and uh, you know much streamlined rather than you know maybe you guess working you know your way out. So hopefully I answered your question. And can I add something to it? Um, Please go ahead. Philip, I'm, I'm guessing that I think um, the developer environment and ecosystem is key. So we might have to find a forum and create an environment where you engage them because they might help with some other. Um, how do you call it, ideations on to making sure that this is implemented within their space. So an engagement with the developer ecosystem would be a, a key point uh, to consider. Yeah, uh, initially, uh, part of the implementation plan is to bring uh, together uh, developers, uh, including fintechs. Now, fintechs is for uh, the uh, non-resident e-commerce service providers. But we plan to bring uh, the developers within the country together, part of the sensitization work that we'll, we'll be doing somewhere in the, in, along the line. So, okay, thank you very much. Um, the next person is Dr. Smith. Please ask your question. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, once again. My questions are twofold. One is um, for players in the fintech space, particularly online payment companies, how um, is this sort of going to play out? I don't know if we have unique situations with the guys in the betting space, knowing that you're collecting payments from various merchants like real time on various transactions. So I'm not sure how the invoicing can be done like severally many times or many transactions. I don't know if that has been considered. Then the other question as well is, in terms of timing and for planning purposes, I hear there's a phased approach. Does GRE have like a schedule that it, it can share with the public to know when my industry will be, you know, onboarded? And in terms of the threshold for revenue, should I be planning towards a Q3 or a Q4 and things like that? Thank you. Yeah, um, Philip, uh, th this is your question. Yes. Yeah, so. For the fintech, in fact, initially when we started uh, the implementation uh, this year, sometime around June, we engaged the fintech service uh, providers. Uh, I think we engaged them in Labadi, we engaged one also in um, La Palm. So we have already engaged the fintechs. And the idea was that uh, we were going to work with them to help us onboard the e-commerce businesses. So that because they have the information at the payment gateways for most of these businesses, we will work with them to do the integration at that point. So that as the non-resident businesses are selling and customers are checking out of their various platforms, we are providing the stamp uh, you know, through the API at the payment gateway and certifying the invoices as we go. So we will have to re-engage. I know it's been a while now. We will have to re-engage the fintech again on this and see how we can work together to fast track the implementation of the solution. Together with also onboarding even the fintechs, uh, you know, businesses onto the event platform as well. So part of the implementation timeline uh, we will engage you further on this. But we've done uh, first engagement with respect to this. Now, timing and then publication of the schedule. Yes, yeah, so in my earlier submission, I had mentioned that currently that analysis is being done. And uh, we'll, be, we'll share that with you shortly once that's available. I'm hoping that by the end of this month, we'll have that information ready and be able to make that available to all of you. Thank you. All right. Okay, thank you. And uh, we have we want to keep strictly to the timeline so that all those uh, who have other things to do can go accordingly. Um, at this juncture, I want us to take a look at the poll question three. Um, uh, please let us have your responses. Poll question three. So technical team, if you can show this poll.
there are two questions. So let's have your comments on that. One and two, just a click. Okay, so we are having multiple say they are moderately prepared for the e invoice. And then in terms of the timeline, we were saying just enough, only 8% says more than enough. So mostly says just enough and then uh, almost an equal percentage, 40% say more time is needed on the GRA. So we send this to Philip as part of his package. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we'll take two more questions. And then, uh, as I said, some of the questions we've seen, it is uh, uh, over 100 plus, and we appreciate that. But some of it, most of it, we, we've seen that the guidelines will answer those. So we have it specifically tagged on so that we can address those with the guidelines done. So when we send the attachment, which will come after this, uh, to all the participants, uh, you will have all those questions. In it. And then there's a toll free number, there's an email and a WhatsApp number. Uh, to be fair with you, uh, the GRA guys have been very responsive, especially on the WhatsApp. Anytime we reach out to them on any question, uh, they are very responsive to answer. So that will be there the toll free number, the WhatsApp number, and then you can also, as well as their email address. So two more questions and then we are done. Uh, Bright 30, please, can you uh, ask your question? Please make it brief. We'll take the two final two at a go. So bright thirty. <laughs> Hello, is bright around? Okay, if bright is not there, then we'll take uh, Gideon Obina Jekum. Gideon Obina Jekum, please can you ask a question? Hello, is bright. Okay, Bryce, please go ahead. Okay, so my question really is that once we are increasing efficiency in terms of re revenue collection, um, <clears throat> are we also considering um, the current rates on, the, on, on businesses in terms of most of the items not being a value added tax line like the get fund and the COVID-19. Are we also considering looking at how best we reduce the burden? Because this system surely will increase efficiency. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I get it well. Uh, George, uh, is there something or, Philip, I don't know if you got the well, question. Um, what I'm getting from um, Bright is that as a GRA is trying to increase um, the level of compliance when it comes to VAT, um, the levies, um, as it were, uh, has made VAT or made, made businesses a bit expensive in terms of the cost side, since the levies are basically cost sitting on taxpayers. And so um, as, as the GRA is doing this, um, are they also considering the possibility of reviewing the levies to bring the rates down, um, so that businesses um, minimize the or there is some sort of uh, reduction on the on the uh, pressure that businesses are going through? Right? Is that your question? Yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay, I think I got it. Okay, okay. So, um, Gideon, do you want me to? Talk or, um, the yes, please go ahead. <laughs> no, George, you can't take this. Okay, one. so so I think it's it's a very um fair and, and good question from from um Bryce, and I would say that I perfectly agree with 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 him. Um, we, sometimes we we say that our our tax rates are high, and uh, partly it's because that um those of us paying the taxes uh, we are in the minority. And so, as the GRA, um, I would that would be my recommendation to the GRA as well. That um, as you are trying to enhance the compliance level, get more revenue. You that that basically means that you are expanding the tax net. 
So as you are bringing more people into the tax net, you are getting people to be more compliant in terms of what is being paid and being reported to the GRE. Uh, it's important that the GRE also, with time, we're looking at then reducing the burden in terms of the rates. Um, because if you put together, uh, depending on which industry, if you are even in the telco, telco sector, then it means VAT is, uh, you are accounting for VAT and associated levies uh, about 23% thereabouts. And so it's quite high um, if you look at it within the, within the sub region. And so um, as we expand the tax net, we also expect that the rates um, should come down um, for those, those who are complying so that government will still get the tax revenue that's expected because of the uh, net being expanded, but in terms of the rates, um, the burden is reduced. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And so the last set of questions I'll throw to Philip, and then we round up. And uh, I'm very grateful for all the uh, your attendance. We've had close to 500, and it's been uh, constant throughout the whole two hours. So it means uh, you were all attentive. You participated uh, greatly, over 100 questions, and then you didn't drop off. Uh, right from the start, the 500 has stayed almost constant right to the end. So thank you very much. Uh, there's a survey at the end, and uh, we'll very much appreciate uh, your comments and so that you give us, you share your survey, uh, you answer the question, you want the feedback, uh, and so that uh, we take your comments into consideration. And so, um, Philip, after we round up, uh, two more questions from you, and then, uh, sorry, one more question, and then we are done. Uh, for companies that have different sales points, something like, I know we mentioned Melcom, but it's a very good example, so I'll use it again, uh, where they have so many shops. How does the integration take place for such an entity? Uh, is there like, do they have like one point where you do the integration or you have to go around and do that? And then secondly, uh, companies or retailers such as, I'll use Malcolm again, they take on products from other entities and then they sell on their behalf. Is there any differentiation or you look at it as a whole together or do you say, uh, we have a shelf, let's say this company, Nivea products or Unilever products on this shelf. Do you differentiate between the two? How does it uh, work out? I don't know if I'm clear. All right. Uh, so, yeah, I think, I think you're clear. So, so the, question, the first question, uh, like for instance, uh, we use Melcom as an example. So it all depends. So most of the, most, every company has a, setup that's unique in their own situation. So we take Malcolm, for example. Uh, Malcolm could have, right, uh, the, the, the setup of their system pointing to one server that sits at their head office. So that even though they may have 74 shops with each shop having, let's say, 10 sales points, all of that could link to the central server that sits at the head office. Or you could have a situation where Melcom has one server for 10 sales points at Melcom Kanishi or Melcom Achimota, right? So it all depends on the setup. Now, so we, when we have that initial meeting, the media meeting with the taxpayer, uh, for example, in this case, where they have uh, different sales points, those are some of the questions that we are asking. Right. How does your configuration, how's the configuration of your system work? Show us the architecture of your system. Show us the setup of your system. So we understand how the connectivity works from the various sales point to your server. If you have a situation where 10 sales points are connected to a server that sits on the local, uh, in, the, in the shop, then we're connecting to that server that sits in the shop. Right. So, so that all the 10 sales points are talking to that server, which also has that connection of that local API. However, if you have, let's say, 10 shops that are connected to one central server, that will connect to that one central server, which sits at your head office, right? So, there's, yeah, so there, it all depends on your setup. But at the end of the day, what we are doing is, we want to get as close as possible to where the sales is happening. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So that we tap in from. Okay. 
Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, at this point, please, before you drop off, uh, please take our survey uh, and answer. We'll also put in all together. We'll yeah, send you. Ask, I'll ask my question. Oh, uh, sorry, uh, Denzel, uh, please, your final one. Uh, I made it, so please, your last question. And then Denzel will close us, us off for the day. My name is Gideon. Uh, okay, okay, Gideon, so, go ahead. So, 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 yeah, I know you have up to Q4 2024 to group everybody up. So for those who are interested in getting on board now, how would the filing be? Because for instance, you will have access to all my revenues. But when it comes to the inputs, some of the people I deal with wouldn't be on your system. And so in terms of filing, how do I do it? Will I have to be doing the manual filing or I will have to, how do I go about it? Very, very good question. Very good question. So yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks for answering, uh, asking that question. So for filing, uh, we uh, that's part of the latter stage of the implementation. So you continue filing as you currently do. Uh, the difference between how you operate now and how you uh, you operate in the future is that now we have uh, well how you've been operating is that now we have all your sales data sitting on the EVA system, right? So you can use that as a reference to check how much you sold for the for the month that you're going to use for the filing. But you continue filing on the taxpayer portal as you currently do. That doesn't change. So if you bought from someone who is not on the EVA system you continue operating the same way as you currently operate. However, what we're doing is, if you bought, you, you bought from someone who is on the EVA system and the person gives you, uh, the person gives you their 10, then you'll be able to bring that data onto the EVA system. So you see all that data on the EVA system. If you buy from someone who is not on the EVA system at all, let's say we have not onboarded that person, and you want to have that, that data on the EVA system, we make a provision for that so that you can load the receipts, but it's not mandatory. You can load the receipts on the EVAT portal. And all of this will go through with you when we start engaging you and onboarding you onto the system. But that's a very, very important question. Answer to the question is continue filing as you currently do, uh, because we anticipate that it will take a long time to have everyone onto the, that, that ecosystem so that the input and output will you start filing straight from the EVA system. But currently you start filing, you continue filing as you currently do. No change in that process at all. Okay. Oh, Gideon, and I, I was going to deny you this excellence, very relevant uh, practical question. So thank you very much for using us to close for the day. So um, General Asha, I want to thank you all for your attendance and not just that, but staying with us throughout the whole period. Um, we'll share with you all the documents that we have and then we'll encourage further engagement afterwards. Um, as you get near to the integration yourself, all about the APIs, ERPs, uh, cyber securities, and all the other things that come with it, uh, please let's continue the engagement. And so from what I've learned here, uh, specifically is the fact that tax refund after this is going to get much easier. And also for the fact that the verification can be done by each taxpayer uh, via the QR code, et cetera. So we are all involved in this. Uh, you can verify and be sure that uh, it's from the certified system. Also, I know that the certified voicing system is uh, mandatory. So once you, you get to your turn, uh, you do have to get on it. Uh, 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 Philip has also mentioned that some companies, such as the betting companies, have been put on hold for now. There will be further deliberations uh, as to how DS is handling. So um, thank you very much. And uh, most importantly, the final portion of it, uh, in terms of this is looking at just at the outputs, but the inputs is looking at, uh, will come on later, depending on whether the supplier has been onboarded or not. Uh, eventually, once we all get on the system, uh, this will be simplified. So thank you. Please uh, take the uh, survey. We appreciate your feedback a lot and uh, have a nice day, everyone. And thank you, Philip. Thank you to our other panelists, George and then Edward. So have a nice day. Thank you. Thanks, Z. Thank you.